Right, today, I was going to say I'm going to keep it simple, but I was going to do some more neuroanatomy, which is never simple. Um, but I'm going to stick to one model. I'll show you why. Thinking about it, I'm going to fail actually. Um, this is the model I want to stick to. The reason why is because um, people have asked for me to talk a little bit about a more neuroanatomy and I want to do the neuroanatomy side, not the neuroscience side, mostly because I can do the neuroanatomy side. And I struggle with the neuroscience side, basically when stuff gets in the brain, magic happens, I'll leave that to neuroscientists. Um, but you know, I, I tend to describe the neuroanatomy side of things as the lumpy bumpy bits, and to a certain extent the tracts and the, you know, the structures that are flowing through the brain, which we do not entirely understand, and it is not completely mapped out right now. This is a work in progress, right? In here, we don't understand it all. Remember that, it will change. Most anatomy is fixed. You, know, you learn your anatomy, you're safe because it's been like this for a long time and it's not changing. But the way we describe the brain and the nervous system is changing. But anyway, when students approach neuroanatomy and when students approach the brain, um, it's, not, it's not the sort of thing you can easily dissect like other parts of the body, right? If you, you know, this fella here, if you want to look in the thorax where you would you would reflect the skin and you'd cut through the ribs and you'd take the ribs off and you'd you'd get into the the thoracic cavity and you'd go through there, you'd find the lungs, you'd find the heart, you'd find the great vessels, you'd find them right, you dissect and you find all this great stuff. But you can't really do that with the brain so easily, because it's very soft and you can't really dissect it. So neuroscientists, they love to show us slices through brain stem and horrible things like that, don't they? They say, here's this tract here, and here's this tract here, and here's, oh man, I can't, I don't know about you, but I can't do that. Um, so what we do when we're studying the nervous system, when we're studying the brain in particular, is we do slices. So I said I was gonna to stick to this model. I'm gonna show you another model, I'm not gonna do it in detail, we'll talk about that in detail another week, but, <clears throat> You see this, this head here, this then is a mid-sagittal section, it's in the midline. And we talked about this last week when we were talking about the dural venous sinuses and looking at all this stuff in, in here and the number of questions I get from students about what's this, what's this, what's this, what's this, what's this, prompted me to think, well, I should, I'll tell you what it all is, right? And vaguely what it does. So that's a section of through here. So if you want to look at the brain, we can cut this way, but... Ugh. We can also cut transverse sections like this, right? Yeah, through here. This is a very expensive model from Somso that we get through Adam Ruli, a beautiful, beautiful model. And of course, looking at it like this is a great way of, of seeing physical three-dimensional structures that you can then relate to MR images and CT images, scans of the brain and the head in different sections, right? So these will be transverse sections through here. And we'll come back to this model in another week. But this week, we'll stick to this mid-sagittal section, right? Um, and what you need to do is you need to look at the brain in different planes of section. And if I try and do that now, I'll be here for three or four hours. So we'll just look at this plane of section and we'll look at the structures we can see here. And then we need to look at the brain in another plane of section, in other planes of section and see what we can see there. And then we can start to build up the shapes of these structures of the parts of the brain inside our own brains. So we develop the spatial awareness, our spatial understanding of where things are, that, that there are indeed discrete structures within the brain that can be described. And the other thing, of course, is, is talking about it, isn't it? Is using the language, is using the words. Uh, when I'm talking with neuroscientists, they'll chuck out lots of different words. Often I get lost because they'll use different language to the language that I use for neuroanatomy, which gets a bit confusing. Um, so part of this is just looking at the structures, saying the words, hearing the words, um, maybe seeing the words and linking all that together as well so that when you come across the strange, the same structure in a different plane of section, you think, oh, I've seen that. that. There it looks like this, but in this section it looks like this. And then you 
now you've got things like this, and you've got things doing that, and you've got nuclei doing that. It just takes time to build up all these structures, get used to the words, and when you get that, life gets so much easier. Like I say, the caveat is, <laughs> the brain is not entirely understood right now, so the things you learn change. Okay, so, on our mid-sagittal section, do you remember we were talking about the dura mater last week? So we can see this superior sagittal sinus up here, but I said the folk cerebri, there's an infold of dura mater, because we can see one side of the cerebrum here, so this is the right cerebral hemisphere here, the left cerebral hemisphere has been taken away, and in between the two cerebral hemispheres, is a sheet of dura mater called the folk cerebri. And because we're in a bang on mid sagittal section, the folk cerebri, that sheet of dura mater has gone. And so have the dural venous sinuses within it. So then what we're seeing here, these structures are actually a little bit, little bit to the side of the mid sagittal section. We're actually within the space here. So we see the right cerebrum, and hopefully you know about the, the lobes of the brain. So we've got the frontal lobe here, the occipital lobe here, uh, and the, the parietal lobe up there. Now, <laughs> what we'd normally look for would be the central sulcus. So we've got gyri and sulci, haven't we? So the gyri are the lumpy bits, and the sulci are the folds in between the lumpy bits. And one feature of the cerebrum we'd look for would be the central sulcus. So you'd find the central sulcus, I say it's part way along here, and there's a sulcus there, so that's possibly it. It's a bit easier if you've got the whole brain, because basically you can see a continuous sulcus all the way around this side, right? But anterior to the central sulcus is the frontal lobe, posterior to the central sulcus is the parietal lobe, right? Then you've got the occipital lobe back here, and we can't see the temporal lobe because it's, it's behind all that stuff, right? Um, but also, just anterior to the central sulcus is the premotor cortex, so we get into the motor regions, and posterior to the central sulcus is the somatosensory cortex. Um, so that's you know, the sensory, so we've got motor anterior to it, sensory posterior to it. So that's why it's a good landmark, because you've got some important bits of the brain there. Yeah, that's the right half of the cerebrum. So as we go down, we've got this big white structure here. And students kind of remember the names of these things. We've got a big white structure, we've got a little white structure, we've got lots of other white structures here. If it's white, then it's probably representing myelinated nerve fibers, right? Myelinated nerve fibers, so the rest of this is mostly gray matter, then the myelinated nerve fibers are axons that are traveling some distance, aren't they? Because if they're myelinated, if they're surrounded by myelin and fat, then action potentials are propagated much faster. So, and this is big, isn't it? This is the corpus callosum. Now the corpus callosum then is a whole bunch of axons that are crossing from one cerebral hemisphere to the other. So if you, if you were to look at other sections, you'd see, you'd see this sort of thing going on. Because the two cerebral hemispheres, we know they kind of do different things. If you damage this side, then you'll see a face on the other side, that sort of thing, right? But the two cerebral hemispheres, they work together. They're connected, they share information. And in fact, if you separate them, you get some very weird effects. But I'll leave that for the neuroscientists. Wouldn't wanna spoil their party. So that's the corpus callosum. Um, it gets called, it has, it's got different names as well, so as in this structure is broken up into different parts. This is the genu, which means knee, as in like this knee here, because look, it's knee shaped, that's the genu. This is the body, and then this is, uh, this is the bandage, uh, splenium. So genu, body, splenium, knee, body, bandage, rolled up bandage. So the big bit is the corpus callosum. Now the smaller one here, this is the fornix, right? And the fornix is different. The fornix is again, it's a whole bunch of myelinated axons, but they're actually coming in from out here. And this is, the fornix is carrying nerves from the hippocampus, which is out in the temporal lobe there. Now the hippocampus, it's, it's big on memory, so it's important on memory, so if you're learning things, your hippocampus is important. It's also important in spatial ability, so maybe it's really important for learning anatomy as well. The famous tests were getting black cab drivers um, and looking at their hippocampuses, hippocampi, hippocampuses, 
before they took the knowledge test, before they learned the knowledge, which is learning all the streets of London, and their hippocampuses got bigger after they'd learned all that spatial stuff than before they started learning all that spatial stuff. Now, a lot, of, a lot of this is associated with actually being in the world and moving around, that sort of spatial awareness, right? Navigation and what have you. Um, and I don't think they've ever got any rats to go and study anatomy to see how that affects their hippocampus. But hey, you know, if it's to do with memory and to do with spatial ability, maybe the hippocampus is important in studying anatomy as well. I don't know if anybody's done that. Anyway, the fornix carries information from the hippocampus, also carries some information to the hippocampus, but so it's a big, big tract. Um, now, between the corpus callosum and the fornix, there's this very, very, very thin membrane, um, and it's called the septum pellucidum. So it's a thin, transparent membrane, and septum means you know, like a fence, or a hedge, a boundary. So the septum is like this, is this fence. Pellucidum means it's transparent because it's kind of see-through. So this is the septum pellucidum. So it's a connected tissue structure. And what we've got is out here, we've got a lateral ventricle. So on the other side of that, we've got a lateral ventricle up there as well. So it's, it's kind of separating off the ventricles from one another and parts of the brain and the midline and stuff like that, right? So septum pellucidum. Um, and while we're talking about ventricles, as we go down here, there's another space here, and this space is the third ventricle. So these are the ventricles which have the, uh, the CSF in them, the cerebrospinal fluid that the brain is bathed in, right? So the third ventricle is this space here in the midline. So those two lateral ventricles are draining into it. Um, and we can see here, this is a choroid plexus. So we have a structure here with a number of blood vessels in there which are contributing to the formation of the cerebrospinal fluid here. And the other thing we see is, is this. So it's in pink on this model. Look at this curvy bit and then this here. And this is the pineal gland. The pineal gland's got a bit of history to it. It's, uh, I think it was um, purloined as the seat of the soul for some reason, I don't really know why. But really what the pineal gland does is it makes melatonin. So it regulates your sleep cycle, right? So that's the pineal gland there. So we've got a fair few lumpy bits here, so don't mix them up. And we've got some more lumpy bits. And as we get down here, we have to be a little bit careful. Now in the wall of the third ventricle, we've got the thalamus. And that's the big knobbly bit. So there are two thalamuses. All right, there's a thalamus on either side of the midline, and the thalamus is generally described as the sensory sieve, right? It's where all the sensory information from your body is, sorry fella, all the sensory information is coming in to your, your central nervous system, is going up to your brain, it goes up to the thalamus, and then the thalamus decides whether it's relevant or not, whether it's important, and if it is, it passes it on to the higher centers. It actually does a lot more than that, but that's a good way of thinking about the thalamus. So that's where the thalamus is. It's in the wall of the third ventricle. So there's one on either side of the midline. And we see this little nub in here. That's an interthalamic adhesion. And neurons may or may not cross from side to side there. I don't think the neuroscientists are entirely sure or convinced. Um, the, each thalamus may be separate or they may there may be some communication from side to side across that interthalamic adhesion, but certainly there's a little nub in there. Um, and if that's the thalamus, then the other structure here is the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus is below the thalamus because that's what hypo means. And the hypothalamus is this region of the brain here. And the hypothalamus is really important in homeostasis, in regulation of stuff that's going on in the body, right? And if you know your anatomy in this region, you'll recognize the pituitary gland here. Now, often when you slice a brain here, you lose the pituitary gland because you've taken the brain out of the skull and the pituitary gland stays, gets caught down in the sphenoid bone here because it's covered over a dura mater and that sort of thing. So a model is a bit of a luxury in that we've actually got the pituitary gland here, which helps us out because the pituitary gland is connected to the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus actually makes some hormones like vasopressin and oxytocin and others, and it sends those hormones down its axons into the posterior pituitary gland where they're released into the blood. The anterior pituitary gland has a whole bunch of cells making a whole bunch of cool hormones which 
are released straight into the blood. So the pituitary gland is connected to the hypothalamus through the infundibulum, pituitary stalk, infundibular stalk, lots of names, <laughs> all right? Now, um, we're getting down towards the midbrain here. 